We want to look at the state of the U.S. economy and what is it going to take to create jobs and demand. My guests are Stephen Whiting, Managing Director, Economics and Market Analysis at Citigroup Global Markets, and our own Peter Coy, Economics Editor, Bloomberg Business Week. All right, Peter Coy, set the stage for us. What's the state of the U.S. economy? We're not in a recession right now, are we? We won't know for sure if we're not in a recession. It certainly doesn't appear that way. We did have job growth, a little over 100,000 in September, revision upward in the August job growth. But you have to say it's a very weak economy that could potentially tip into recession, especially if we get more bad news out of Europe. And the news there seems to break badly every day. Steve Whiting, when you take a look at the jobs picture, about 8 million jobs were lost during the recession. Yes. We have now gained back about 2.5, 2.6 million jobs. So we do have a ways to go, but we are creating jobs. Is it just the pace of job creation that's at stake? Well, it's an extremely deep hole. That kind of a drop that we've had in the downturn was the worst in post-war history. Uh, and the kinds of improvement that we're seeing right now, which we think we might even be seeing a bit of a slowing from it now uh, is not consistent with taking up any labor market slack. We're seeing extremely long uh, duration of unemployment. It just takes lots and lots and lots of strong sustained growth and that's difficult usually in periods that follow credit crises. All right. Now we also have to talk about wages because those people that are employed, we are at a 9.1 percent unemployment rate. That means that the people who are working, they're receiving wages. But are those wages increasing enough in order to meet the rising cost of some commodities. Well, this year, uh, a good part of that was lost. I mean, in the first half of the year, uh, we did fairly good on nominal wage gains, and more than half of that was lost just to the gasoline tank. Uh, but we think incrementally from here, probably past a September number, uh, that that will be fading back. And uh, at least in September, we saw some uh, slightly stronger real wage gains uh, in the data. But this is nothing really to write home about. Again, it takes a long period of strong, sustained growth. Uh, it's not easy to get uh, companies to hire workers they don't need. The aggregate pace of demand is uh, in, the, in the economy is not much higher than it was in 2007. So it's a long way back. Peter Coy, as the economics editor of Bloomberg Business Week, are we going to hear a debate about whether John Maynard Keynes, the English economist, was correct in his prescription for getting out of depressions and recessions versus Frederick Hayek from the Austrian school? Is this really what we're still debating? Well, I don't think we're going to hear that debate tonight because the Republicans are pretty united in, in being against sort of Keynesian kinds of stimulus on the demand side, unless Charlie Rose grills them on it, which he might. But I was really struck by a report that came out this week from an economist at a group called uh, Sentia Research who found that median household income adjusted for inflation fell over the past two years. That's after the recession ended by more than 6%. I mean, it's shocking that instead of growing out of the recession, instead of bouncing off the bottom, we see this downward, uh, dec uh, outright decline in incomes or households. Well, does this indicate that we're just facing global opportunities in the form of low cost wages in places like China and India? Well, that's certainly part of it. But I think it's also just a shortfall of demand in this country. We see the paradox of thrift coming in here where businesses aren't investing, they're, they're hoarding cash. Consumers are trying to fix their balance sheets so they're spending less. And the government, which has been putting a lot of stimulus into the economy, is reaching the point where people feel like it can't do more or shouldn't do more, and so we're losing that as well. Steve Whiting, is it also possible that we're just facing a demographic challenge with the baby boom generation facing retirement? They're just going to buy less stuff and they're going to conserve the cash that they have. Well, you know, there are cyclical forces that I think are somewhat bigger than that and, or just the general uh, lapse that we had in the economy. I mean, discretionary spending is only rebounding from a 50-year low share of total activity. It looks like uh, Americans are driving around an 11-year-old average vehicle stock uh, and the sales numbers have picked Picked up, uh, but there are million annual units in auto sales. Oh, 13, and that's okay. still below the troughs of most recessions. So uh, I, 
I honestly think we can do better than this. Uh, we, we seriously can, and a good deal of the leading indicators are up. But again, just the depths of the decline behind us are important. Demographics are really important, strikingly different in the next 20 years than any other period in history. Uh, and that's going to mean an awful lot, but a, but a very long conversation on that, on that. But I think we have to think that a good deal of, of what we're, where we are at right now is related to the downturn just behind us. And when you talk about demographic issues, that's got to bring in things like Social Security, the yes. solvency of the Social Security Trust Fund, but also spending on health care, particularly on Medicare. Yeah, this is something I focused on a great deal. I mean, the Medicare system has grown outlays 9.3% for the last 30 years, and that's not counting the first 15 years of startup costs, uh, this is not something that we could ever sustain when sort of we tax wages to pay for that, which are growing at half that rate, optimistically. So uh, there are going to have to be some serious trade-offs. In fact, Peter's written about this in a pretty nice article. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we're going to have to make some trade-offs. I mean, you can't have an ever larger share of your life in retirement, but more so. I mean, we could literally uh, go off the cliff trying to, you know, uh, sustain ourselves on health care at, at levels that I think are ultimately just beyond any kind of rational spending number and take away a great deal from the young if we do that. All right, well, Coy, let's talk about the housing market. Is that what got us into this mess in the first place and we just have to wait it out? Housing was a hugely important part of this problem because where was the debt that we accumulated? A lot of it was on housing, mortgage debt, home equity loans, and so on. We, when the housing prices went up, what we did is we used our houses as ATMs and over leveraged. Even people who had good increases in, in their equity used it all up by borrowing against it. And that's coming back to, to haunt us now. The only thing I can say good about housing now is that housing construction is so low that it just can't go any lower. The, the, the worst it can do is not contribute, but it's not going to hurt GDP from here on, and I think eventually it's got to start helping. Stephen Whiting, the housing industry right now, do we need to wait until this just works its way through the system? There are some estimates that we've got, what, about 4 million homes in shadow inventory, and then a four, another 4 million homes that are for sale. Well, we're not going to work through this uh, all at once and suddenly turn on the lights again. I mean, uh, it looks like uh, close to 40% that inventory is in two states. Home builders don't need to build next to foreclosed properties. Uh, but as Peter said, I think that, you know, there's almost no problem for home builders other than low sales. We're selling fewer than one new home per thousand Americans annually. Um, and that's why these, you know, statistics about if we're going to recession or not going to recession, what do we mean by that? A lot of these st statistics are functionally close to zero, and they're early cycle recession drivers. Uh, they're at extremely low levels, uh, and from a, uh, an income and output perspective, uh, I don't think that that provides much risk to the economy. And even if we grow grew rapidly, it's so low that we're not going to be able to drive a lot of economic activity because of it. Um, I tend to think that people have slightly overstated the case that housing debt made the economy do wonderful things. The same years that the economy was growing very modestly in 02 to 07, uh, housing activity was strong, but the broader economy wasn't. We had lots and lots of financial imbalances. We had um, a great deal more leverage in the financial system itself. That's why a balance sheet recession, rather than uh, as bad as it was in the real economy, I think that uh, that was our, our really uh, the killer problem. But can you make the case that the leverage in the financial system then bled over into the housing industry and that created the demand for all of these workers and that we're still waiting for some other industry or some government panacea to come in and take up the slack because you have people that want to work that can't find jobs? Oh, there's no doubt that housing was too strong and that had effects on employment. But now you're dealing with across 19 different industries, including finance, manufacturing and construction you're dealing with, you know, three and a half percent of employment versus uh, five and a half percent. What you see is pervasive declines in the last few years, pervasive declines in every cyclical industry as far as you could, you could look at any of the aggregates. That's one of the reasons why you don't want to argue that all of this is really structural. If you say housing for some, you know, reason that I don't really believe. But you mentioned it's really only in two, in two or three states. This is where you've well, seen the, the depression in housing. The inventory. For, for just as an inventory. example, because housing is a yes. very regional has to fall forever. Uh, but, you know, one of the things you'll have to do is you'll get a lot of growth in, in other parts of the economy. And the last cycle, small and medium-sized business employment provided all of the incremental job gains. Uh, and so, uh, you know, maybe there are arguments that you need to do better on the large business side, but we have to do better on the small and medium-sized business sector, in my view.
Peter Coy, I want to ask you about China and trade policy. That's going to be a topic in tonight's oh, sure presidential debate. Are, are we just going through a period where there's just so much more cheap labor available in the world that no matter what kind of policy you put together in the United States, it's very difficult to compete with people that are willing to work for a lot less than an American worker? Well, don't forget that the U.S. has higher productivity per worker, and that helps justify the higher wages we earn in the U.S. And so the critical factor uh, is not to try to lower our wages to Chinese levels, but to keep raising our productivity so we can justify those higher wages. That has to be a theme for whoever's president uh, starting next term. And I think tr that they will focus on China, and they will focus on trying to get China to revalue the yuan, which is probably a good thing. Stephen Whiting, what's the one question, if you could, would you like to ask of the Republican presidential contenders? Well, um, you know, if you have to uh, get the budget on track in the future and you want to have all of the defense, Medicare, Social Security, and make your interest payments, how are you going to do that uh, with federal revenues uh, limited uh, to some level like you are now? I mean, in 10 years' time, those programs are as big as all of the revenue we, we collect right now. So something must be done. Uh, right. to broaden that revenue or do something with these programs. Tough question. I love it. All right, I want to thank you very much. Stephen Whiting joining us from Citigroup. Over the past 15 years, small businesses have created about 65% of all new jobs in the United States. My guests are Todd McCracken. He's the president and chief executive of the National Small Business Association. And also with us, Bloomberg Business Week economics editor Peter Coy. Todd McCracken, what's the state of small business? Are they able to compete and are they creating jobs? Well, they're able to compete pretty well. They're not creating many jobs, though, in point of fact. They've created a good share of the private sector jobs that have been created in the last couple of years, but that's not many jobs, not like we've seen in the past. So uh, I agree with the guest you had on a few minutes ago that said that, that, that this is the area to continue to focus on. Small businesses, uh, the last time we had a recession, had grown a million jobs before, uh, as we came out of that recession while large companies were still laying off. It's not happening this time for a whole host of reasons, but... Uh, it's where we've got to focus. Peter Coy, the idea being that there are jobs perhaps out there, they're just mismatched with the people and the skills. That is something that you hear a lot from the people who don't favor more fiscal stimulus. They say it's all a supply side problem. It's all because Americans aren't ready to work. That or they don't have the skills or they can't move because they're underwater in right. their current and home certainly locations. That's, that's, certainly that's a component. But I think that in the late 1990s, we also had problems with skills in the workforce, and yet we saw unemployment falling below 4%. So if there is strong demand, employers get a little less picky, and suddenly they'll find that maybe they can bring people in. Maybe they have to do a little on-the-job training, and they'll turn out to be very useful parts of their workforce. So what we need is growth, not complaint wringing our hands over the lack of skills in the U.S. workforce. Todd McCracken, the idea that we need demand in the United States, is that what's going to help small businesses? Oh, I think that's exactly right. I mean, yeah, there are some jobs mismatch. Uh, uh, maybe the extensions of unemployment insurance have encouraged a few people to stay out of the job market a little bit. But fundamentally, it's lack of demand, and it's the uncertainty side of things. Because small companies, uh, they may be doing fine now, but they're not sure what's going to happen in six months. Their customers don't know what's going to happen in six months. But so let me just push in, Todd McCracken. Term. When you talk about uncertainty, what makes things so much more uncertain now than, let's say, 10 years ago? Haven't businesses always faced uncertainty? Uncertainty? They've always faced uncertainty, and that's what makes uh, entrepreneurship such a, a pivotal thing. These are people who are willing to push through and take risks. But now their customers are the ones who are facing a lot of uncertainty, uncertainty about what uh, the cuts can happen in the economy. I think our federal government has dramatically increased uh, uh, the uncertainty problem uh, through the brinksmanship over the summer with the debt limit. Uh, they've got more opportunities to do that coming up, which they really need to avoid <laughs> if they can. Uh, and that's created a significant problem because people aren't committing to, uh, uh, to their vendors for the long term. So they're not willing to hire. This idea that there's this uncertainty among the business the community, is not Peter Kort. Uncertainty, but certainty. The certainty being that demand is very weak. If we could get demand going, then they'd be they have certainty that demand is strong. But what about the idea that the government is going to pick up the slack for demand in the private sector until the private sector comes back? 
Well, that is uh, the Keynesian solution, and you're not going to hear much of it tonight in Hanover. I was thinking, I just had friends who came back from Mount Washington. They talk, as soon as you step out of your car, you get icicles in your nose. It's as if the presidential candidates are going to be sitting in Hanover, and the American people are going to be up on the top of Mount Washington, hanging on by their fingernails with a buffeting hurricane force of winds. There's a visual image where I want to thank you very much. Bloomberg Business Week's economics editor, Peter Coy, Todd McCracken, the head of the uh, small, National Small Business Association. Coming up.